Greetings, goblins. Welcome to another episode of RCR CBC RPG. Today we're taking another dive into mazes for part deuce. I've been excited to tear into this section of mazes because I feel like this is some of the real meat and potatoes that really makes the game shine and sets it apart from other rules like games. So without further ado, cue the music. Read, comment, review. Chapter by chapter with you A new RPG we can all referee On my PDF folders a crew So for some reason, after I recorded this entire video, I realized that I had my giant dumb head covering the entire thing. So I might have to do a couple of fancy editing maneuvers to make this footage worthwhile. I really don't want to record it twice, so bear with me if this looks a little clunkier than usual. Thanks. Alright, so resources. Looking cautiously around the first corner, Tomas set off, beginning his search through the maze. Not all actions can be accomplished by rolling dice. In some situations, performing an action requires spending a resource to accomplish a goal. These are costs that are paid by the players or the maze controller. These actions tend to be large and impactful. The act of paying a cost, sometimes called a spend, or rolling the dice, should be the same. A spend result is equivalent to an automatic success. The basic resources in mazes are the moment, hearts, stars, treasure, and darkness. Hearts and stars are individual resources. Treasure and darkness are party resources held in common. Moments are your turn. Each resource controls a different aspect of the game. Moments. There's no need for clear timing in a mazes game. In an effort to keep the game more about rulings than rules, we are actively trying not to overexplain. Each player gets a moment. Taking an action in game spins your moment. A player's moment can be a roll, a description, an action, or a spend. The most important timing rule is that everyone gets a moment before anyone else gets another moment. Then, the maze controller narrates the world's response. The structure of play is as follows. In any order, each player takes a moment or passes. For their moment, each player explains what they are doing. The MC may have that player roll or spend a resource. After all the players have gone, the maze controller takes their turn. The player's roles in response are saves and do not count as moments. So this is sort of your, I would call it out of combat turn order. It's just a nice way to remember to let each player shine and have their moment, literally. Um, this is also something that happens in games like Index Card RPG. And I think this is a really succinct way of putting it without getting too overly complex. Hearts. Now this is something I think is truly interesting and unique about mazes, and I really like the way that hearts work in mazes. Again, there are other games like Index Card RPG that use hearts, but they're just a little bit different here. A heart represents a character's life force and energy. It is the basic hit point. A character's hearts are set by their roll, equal to their crown. The more hearts you have, the hardier and more able to do physical battle you are. Paragon has four, Vanguard has six, Fighter has eight, Sentinel has 10. The grind of battle. Every time a character takes a violent action, they lose a heart. Yes, this means that almost every time they make an attack roll, they are spending a heart. Now I know what you're thinking. Immediately you're like, oh wow, that means your hearts are disappearing super fast because if you're taking damage and you're spending your hearts to attack, if you're the Paragon, you're done in like two hits or four turns. But there's a caveat here, and it's the way that you get hearts back. It's just an action to rest. So if you are completely out of hearts and you want to spend more time in the fight, you just spend an action resting and you gain all your hearts back. It's a really interesting way to leave things feeling cinematic and keep the action intense and moving, but still allow the players to have resources they're draining. I really like this as an aspect of mazes, especially if you're doing one shots or shorter series because it keeps people wanting to move ahead without stopping to rest and things like that. Instead your rest is just a single action. 
This represents the toll on a character from the exertion of battle. Attacking will lead to conditions if a character makes enough of them, becoming tired, stressed, and eventually hurt from the exertion alone. Characters generally don't lose hearts for other types of actions. Characters don't lose hearts for violent actions that are saves, defending themselves in battle, for instance, since the save roll has its own consequences. Characters do not lose a heart when they spin a star on a violent action. As they are already spinning a resource, this pays the cost of their exertion. Characters generally don't spin hearts for any other types of actions, but they do lose them in battle. And that's an important caveat too. Stars can be spent on things like casting spells, or what we would call like critical or exciting actions, daring deeds, but you can also spend a star if you want to avoid losing a heart. Taking damage. Whenever a character takes damage, they lose a number of hearts equal to the danger of the hazard. The more hearts a character has, the more damage they can take from each attack, and the longer they can keep fighting. Monsters and characters controlled by the maze controller also have hearts. When you deal damage to them, you roll your die to determine how many hearts they lose. When a character runs out of hearts, they go down. When you go down, you must take a condition, explained later in this section, to refill your hearts and to stand back up. If they can't take a condition, your character is out of the scene and may possibly even die. Stars. Stars represent the special power that a character possesses. Whether it be magical, training, wealth, or their lineage, each aspect has a different way of imagining stars and what they can do. Star spins allow your character to take the spotlight and con gain control of the situation. A star can be spent for a number of things, but primarily it is spent to take some narrative control of the game, either through the use of magic or a character ability. A character's stars are defined by their role, and here we see that the Paragon has the most with four, Vanguard has three, Fighter has two, and Sentinel only has one. Spending stars. A character spends their stars to do magic and take special actions. Like hearts, a character can refill their stars by taking a condition, either as a result of going down or taking a rest action. So I did fail to mention that when you take the rest action, you also take on a condition, and you can only take on so many conditions before you die. So really that is more a determining factor of like what we would see as like HP more so than even hearts. The number of conditions you take on piles up and then eventually you die if you take on too many. When a character spins a star, they are putting themselves in the center of the story and doing something out of the ordinary. Spinning a star, if approved by the MC, guarantees success. The MC may not accept what you want to spin your star for, but if they do accept the spin, you always get the effect. Star spins never require a roll. Each of the aspects in mazes uses stars in a slightly different way, but they have some things in common. How a character might use their stars is described under aspect, as well as specific examples given within some class descriptions, flashbacks, and details. Regardless of their aspect, a player can always spin a star to establish something about the game world and their character, such as creating friends and contacts, hand-waving details, and declaring new things about their character or the world's past. Example, Ravella is a witch. She spends one of her stars during a game to establish that she spent a lot of time in the Birchwood as a young adept. The MC thinks this is fair and so accepts the star spend. Now Ravella has additional insight about the place. Later in the game, as a wise soothsayer, she spends a star to use her familiar, an edge, to take the spotlight. Having her giant flying eel companion flow out from her voluminous robes and carry her out of the shaft she has fallen into. Okay, this is another great aspect about mazes. Gather darkness. Throughout the adventure, a party will generate darkness, which is both a resource for the MC and a signpost to the players of how dangerous the current situation has become. You can track darkness with a d12, a play aid, or tokens, but darkness should be visible to all the players. The MC uses the darkness level as an aid to telling the story and as a pacing mechanism. In addition, the MC can spin darkness as fuel for obstacles and monsters. The MC will give the players treasure based on the story. Our rule of thumb is that a maze will contain at least one more potential treasure 
than the number of adventurers. While the maze controller controls what treasure is possible, darkness is created by the actions and activities of the players. Now I think this is a really cool sort of meta currency. Meta currencies are in a lot of RPGs, but the way that darkness works and the visual component of it, I think is really satisfying. Because in my opinion, for so many different TTRPGs, the meta currency can seem like it's at the whim of the GM, like they're just deciding, oh, you did something I like, so I'm gonna hand out the meta currency. As for this instance we have here on the top right section, some very specific reasons the darkness might go up. Darkness is generated by the following activities of the players. They find treasure. They encounter something hazardous. They enter the darkness or the dungeon. They split the party. Time passes. They ignore danger and flashbacks. These are all very solid and very actionable reasons to raise that darkness counter on the die. And having that D12 or whatever you use, like they say something physical here, can really up the tension for the players. I think this is a very solid mechanism for the game. And here we break down the different reasons for the darkness to increase. Treasure. Darkness can be set by the party based on their starting treasure reserves and funding new expeditions. This can be an arbitrary spin in a one-shot game, or a spin from their wealth reserves. At the start of the game, the party determines how much treasure they have. The amount of treasure and the starting darkness are set to the same number. How the party answers the leading questions at setup may increase or decrease the starting darkness. Each of their potential answers as to why they are in the dungeon can have a darkness cost. If they're only there to steal, maybe it's a plus zero darkness. But if they are there to fight their ancient rival, it's a plus three darkness. Hazardous encounters. Whenever the party encounters a hazard, a monster, trap, environment, or other peril, the MC gains a darkness. Mechanically, this means that when the party has an encounter, the MC should have at least one darkness to spend per encounter as well as being a signal to the party that there is something specific for them to overcome. The MC doesn't have to spend the darkness generated by an encounter, which allows them to ramp up the overall danger of the session at their own pace. Entering the darkness. This is both physical and metaphorical darkness. When the character enters a scene or area which is dark or unknown, where they don't know what is going on, they are increasing the darkness. This is always the first action of a game. As the party crosses the threshold into the unknown, they will always be giving the maze controller at least one darkness. Splitting the party. Finally, whenever the party splits into smaller groups, add a darkness. Splitting the party is sometimes necessary, but if the MC puts the fear of splitting up into their minds early, the party will stay together, which means more action and a more streamlined story. Again, this is typically a game for smaller sessions, maybe one-shots, or mini-campaigns, so this is a good way to kind of rein things in and keep it moving along. Time Passes Time Passes is a catch-all for being passive or wasting time. Whenever the party chooses to take actions that will either take a lot of time, or where they decide to wait for something to happen, add a darkness. As an aside, we have found that threatening to take a darkness for time passing is a great way to get the party to decide on an action. Again, this is something I really like about this mechanic. You could just say like, hey guys, if you sit here for too long, darkness is going to go up. That might light a fire under the party and get them moving. Just the threat of the darkness growing might be enough to keep the momentum going. Since the characters are the protagonists of the story, when they wait for things to happen, or are indecisive or slow, they're giving the MC the ball, and they get a darkness. When they take actions, often good, solid, proactive actions, that will take a lot of time to complete, the MC takes a darkness to show the cost of spending the time. This also gets around that sort of troublesome idea of someone saying like, well, we'll just set up a whole bunch of traps whenever the goblins show up, those poor, poor goblins we'll have set all these amazing traps, we took an hour to do it. Well that's fine, but darkness is gonna go up one. I just think it's a really solid way to keep the momentum of a game going without it feeling too arbitrary and with having that physical die or something like tokens to set out. 
to really let the party know what they're getting themselves into. Because each time the darkness grows, that's a resource for your MC and all of the minions they control. Ignoring danger. If the party seems to be ignoring the dangerous situation they're in, that creates darkness. Making a lot of noise in a silent tomb had a darkness. Running across an ancient rickety bridge in full armor had a darkness. Sticking your hand into the mouth of a demon statue without inspecting it had a darkness. Opening a door and then running away, that's a darkness. For the party, this means that they can try anything, but there are consequences. For the maze controller, it is a powerful way to steer the actions of the characters without railroading them through a maze. I love that. Flashbacks. The most interesting of all reasons for adding a darkness is the flashback. At any time, the players can call for a flashback to establish something about the game, their characters, the MC characters, etc. These flashback scenes have a cost in that they add a darkness to the pool, but they can also be a great way to create advantage for the players. The old wizard told us about how to avoid a spear toad's deadly venom. To describe a reason for something being prepared, the old wizard gave you a whistle to summon a heavy wind, or to establish story and connection. The old wizard never told you that he was your father. Flashback scenes should be resolved both immediately and quickly. You can have a flashback in the middle of a scene. Encourage the players to use flashbacks to their advantage, as this will increase their ownership of the story and drive a rich and engaging narrative experience. I first heard about flashbacks in Blades in the Dark, but I think it's a great mechanic here and it's well balanced by the use of darkness. The Rising Darkness. Darkness isn't simply a resource. It's a barometer of the danger and a way to provide pacing and control to the story. As the darkness rises, things get harder for the characters. Over the course of a game, it will continue to rise and get more deadly. Now I know you've been thinking, why does this add tension to the game? Well, you're about to see. This is the bright condition when you only have one, two, or three darkness. While the darkness is three or less, things look bright. They are fresh, clear, and in relative control. While this is happening, the party's lamps are shining and their bellies are full. While it is bright, the players always succeed when they roll a crown. Things are easy and safe. If things are bright while rolling against death's door, the roll is advantaged. Torchlit. Four, five, six darkness. Things are torchlit when the darkness is under seven. This is the main meat of any adventure. Many adventures will start with the characters in this state. There are no advantages or disadvantages when things are torchlit. When a character rolls their crown, they may spend a star or treasure to make a deal with the maze controller to succeed. In some situations, they may be able to take a narrative concession. This is called a negotiated success. Bleak, seven or more darkness. If the darkness is more than seven, things are bleak. When things are bleak, the characters always lose on a crown roll. The mood is dark, gritty, and scary. If things are bleak while rolling against death's door, the roll is disadvantaged. If any of you are familiar with the game Darkest Dungeon, the torchlight here is very similar to the way torches work in that game. I really love this mechanic. I think it's one of the things that makes mazes shine. It adds just a little bit of nuance to the game and gives the MC a lot to do. Treasure and Wealth. A land of dangerous villains, volcanoes, underground mazes, and ruthless spies to find the treasure. The accumulation of treasure is often the only real goal of an adventuring party. Within mazes, all treasure and wealth has been abstracted, as this isn't a game about accounting or shopping. Treasure is a group resource shared in common by the party. Wealth represents the assets that a character has and determines what their lifestyle looks like outside of games. Treasure is fungible. It rises and falls. It is spent, lost, and gained over the course of a game session. It represents the total of the free and available goods that the party has access to their equipment and gear, their loose cash, and their other physical and immaterial goods. Through the course of an adventure, a party will spend treasure for effects and gain treasure as loot and rewards. Treasure can be used as equipment to generate advantage and ultimately to pay expenses and purchase higher lifestyles and fund new expeditions. Treasure can be spent as a negotiation point with the MC, starting wealth and lifestyle. Unless a class or the MC says otherwise, all starting characters are assumed to have paid 
for a copper lifestyle and have two wealth. Gaining treasure. Treasure is an abstract idea. It's not a pile of coins, it's just the idea of a pile of coins. Whenever the party acquires things of value regardless of type, they add a treasure to their pile. That evil mercenary has a chest of gold, a treasure. You find a pile of magic scrolls in the wizard's room. Nice, two treasures. I do want to stop and say, for a game, again, that is more one-shot oriented or smaller campaign oriented, this is a really good way to sort of like quickly decide treasure and things like that, not worry too much about what you're giving the party, because it is a resource they're literally going to spend like they would their stars and hearts. Darkness affects treasure. While it is bright or torchlit, any treasure spent affects the entire party. When it is bleak, treasure spends only affect a single player. If the amount of treasure that the party has dips below the number of players, the party becomes scant which adds a darkness. If the amount of treasure that the party has is double the number of players, then the party becomes encumbered, which adds a darkness. This is sort of a balancing incentive to either encourage your players to spend their treasure and not hoard it, or at a certain point to not spend any more and hold on to it a little longer. Another great feature of how the darkness and treasure can work in tandem. Spending a treasure to create equipment and advantage. A player can spend a treasure to have the necessary equipment to accomplish a task. This works in a simple way. Tell your MC what equipment you have and spend the treasure. While the party could have anything in their packs, those things should be kept within reason. They should be things that they could conceivably have. It makes sense that you may have packed fishing poles, antitoxin, wolfsbane, hammer and pittens, or even a cage of doves. It is unlikely that you have a lock of a princess's hair without a flashback, the key to an ancient chest, or the long-lost amulet of protection. Most of the time, this is done in place of making a roll. Oh, we have a ladder. We don't need to climb check this wall. Sometimes the party will need to find a way to create advantage that doesn't come from their edges. Treasure can be used to create temporary advantage. Example. I reach into my pouch and pull out marbles to pour on the stairway, or we packed lanterns so we can light them to see in this darkness, or I have a potion of invisibility in my bag, or I packed ropes and pittons so that we can scale this wall. Again, I really like how treasure is outlined in this, I think this is another great aspect of mazes. Treasure is a group resource, but a personal choice. Treasure is held in common by all of the players. Players should track their treasure via tokens a d12, or with a play aid. Any player may spend a treasure as their action. They do not need agreement or to ask the other players to use it. Treasure represents the gear, equipment, and gold that the party has distributed amongst the party. But you can bet your bucket once that treasure dips below the number of the party and starts adding darkness, people are going to have something to say about it. Funding an expedition. When getting ready to go on an adventure, the members of the party need to fund their expedition as well as settle their lifestyle. Increase the party's starting treasure coffers by one treasure by spending two wealth or spending one wealth and giving the MC one darkness. And there's a roll table here for treasure. The epilogue. When the adventurers return from the maze, there's a special phase called the epilogue. During this time, the players have the opportunity to heal, pay upkeep, and advance their characters. In order, each of the players rest and recover, roll for treasure, pay expenses, lifestyle upkeep and upgrade, change or advance their characters, perform any closing rituals. Okay, now we deal with rest and recovery. When the party returns from an adventure, if any of the characters are hurt, the party must first spend a treasure to heal everyone in the party. Roll for treasure. After healing up, each player rolls their die once for each treasure the party has remaining. That's that little table we saw just a minute ago. If the party has three treasure in their coffers, each player rolls their die three times. Most of the time, treasure will become coins or simple items that can be converted directly into wealth, but it could be magic, lore, or extra valuables. When magic items or weapons are found, work with your MC to determine the effect. Whenever a character gains a new edge, they can choose to add that magic item or magic weapon to their character. Or, they can choose to drop any existing edge and take the item or weapon right now. Until then, 
They may carry that item, but knowing how to use it correctly is a different matter. A player may spend a magic item they have as a treasure while in a maze, but I would only recommend that in a very dire situation. A roll of strange loot means that this particular treasure is something of great value to another group, perhaps a local lord, a powerful sorceress, or a bugbear tribe. It can either be sold for one wealth or given to the party for one-time use of the friend's edge or something else. If a player rolls their crown on this roll, they may instead choose to take lore, having found something of value to the character, but not of obvious sellable worth. This could be a plot hook for another session, a family heirloom, a cultural artifact, etc. Work with your MC to understand how to resolve this item. After making these rolls, total all of the wealth and divide it amongst the players, however the party sees fit. Again, this might be good for newer players. It's a nice, quick way to divvy up loot and do sort of downtime activities without getting bogged down by it. Expenses. Wealth is a character's individual goods, coin, and how they fund their lifestyle. In a campaign or series of connected games, a character needs to spend wealth to maintain their lifestyle. All of a character's expenses are handled by their lifestyle or via spending wealth. Each lifestyle denotes the cost of things the character can assume that they are able to buy without a problem, i.e. not spending wealth. You could hire a mercenary by spending a wealth, or acquire a room at an inn. Anything that you would normally think about spending money on can be acquired by spending treasure, food, drink, vices, etc. Things that are within your lifestyle are just acquired. Unless stated otherwise, characters start campaigns at a copper lifestyle. Why else would you be adventuring? Now let's see about upgrading your lifestyle. While paying your expenses, you can choose to spend wealth to increase your tier. It costs five wealth to move up a tier and assumes you can pay for it at the start of a future adventures. Lifestyle. Characters with the wealth or rank edge increase their lifestyle by one tier. The friend's edge allows a character to act as if they have a lifestyle one tier higher while active in their friend's domain. Gold. Spend one wealth a session or fall to silver. This character is extremely wealthy and can easily purchase fine goods and excellent services. Their pouch is filled with gold monarchs and dragons. They don't need to worry about the cost of anything. They have it. They have access to the best food, can own land, have servants, and are otherwise rich. While in the gold tier, spending a wealth can purchase a boat, land, rare valuables, and the like. Silver. Spend one wealth a session or fall to copper. Did I say session? I meant season. This character is doing well for themselves. Their pouch is full of silver falcons and the odd electrum piece. They can afford to stay in inns, buy meals, they may own a home in a city or a town, or possibly a farm or ranch. They have quality clothes, weapons, and tools. They have no problem eating and drinking well. They can spend wealth to temporarily live gold, to host a lavish affair, acquire a mount, etc. Copper. Spend one wealth a year or fall to broke. This character is surviving. They have a purse with copper pennies and filed tarnished silver groats. They have a place to sleep and spend their days working or traveling. Their boots need mending and their cloak needs patching, but they can eat a hot meal every day. You are Kvothe. Broke. This character is destitute. Each day is a struggle for food and shelter. They are sleeping in the streets or out in the wilderness. They eat whatever they can get their hands on, and they are desperate. At the start of every game session, a broke character takes either the stressed or tired condition. Advances. Now that the adventure is over and you're settled back at the end to reflect, you have the opportunity to change or advance your character. If this was their first adventure, you may choose to exchange any edge that the character has for another edge but not in advance. This shows that a character has grown or changed. If this is the second adventure that that character has survived, they may add an edge. This edge can be any edge, including advances. This shows the growth that the character has undergone over the course of their career. Beyond that, each time a character successfully completes an adventure, they have the option to exchange any edge for a different edge. Conditions. He moved as far within the stony maze as he could go found a reasonably level spot, collapsed there, and slept. Conditions are another major part of mazes, and they get taken on throughout the course of play. They are really more representative of your health than even your hearts are in some ways. 
A condition is a special kind of cost that the players take as a result of certain actions. Conditions limit a character in some way and have a method for removing or clearing themselves. Conditions are most often taken as a result of going down or a result of specific hazards, such as being frozen or poisoned. A condition can be treated like any other edge in the maze's game, in that it describes a character, can be invoked, and explains how and why things happen. Unlike other edges, conditions are generally negative and temporary. Standard Conditions While there can be countless conditions, most are specific to situations and environments. Every character has three standard conditions, stressed, tired, and hurt, which are listed in the character sheet. There is also a space for another condition. You can only have a condition once. If you would take a condition that you already have, you must select another condition to take. If you can't take a condition because they are full, you must go down. If you already have a condition, and you would have to take that condition again, you instead take the condition down the chain. And here we have the chain. Stress, tired, hurt, down. Failing a save. In some situations, you will gain a condition because you failed a save roll. When fighting against the mushroom assassin, you fail your blades roll and take poison. In other situations, an obstacle or environment will impose a condition instead of doing damage. The murder ghost doesn't do damage when it hits. It saps strength, causing the tired condition. When you take a non-standard condition, like blinded or on fire, the MC will explain what you need to do or what effects are in play. If you would take that condition again, you then take a standard condition instead. Now, here we finally get an explanation of resting and how it works. A player can spend their action to rest and catch their breath in order to refill their hearts and stars to their full value. As a result of this action, you must take a condition. In many cases, the story will determine which condition you should take, but in cases where you are taking a standard condition to refill your hearts or stars, you may choose which condition you take, dropping to zero. When a character drops to zero hearts, they go down and take the down condition. When you go down, you have to either receive healing or knock on death's door in order to get back into the fight. If another character spends an action to aid you, you can roll on the healing chart. If you choose, or if no one is able to aid you, you can stare death in the eye and knock on the door to the afterlife by rolling on knock on death's door. When it is possible to take down directly as an effect, such as being knocked unconscious or falling off a roof, usually you will take down as a condition because you are already hurt and have to take hurt again, or another cascading condition, or you were reduced to zero hearts. Knocking on Death's Door Every time you knock on Death's Door, you are tempting fate and your soul lies in the balance. If death doesn't take you, you are still marked by the experience. Take Marked. While you are marked, you are at disadvantage for future Death's Door rolls. Clearing a Condition It is not expected that a character will clear a standard condition during gameplay, except where it says so on the healing chart. During a session, Characters can only clear a condition with some heroic effort or for non-standard conditions with an action listed with the condition. During the epilogue, a character clears all of their conditions, including hurt, marked, and wounded. There is not a cost to clear tired or stressed or marked, but hurt and wounded require spinning a treasure. See epilogue for more. And here we have the effects of the different conditions. Stress. While you are stressed, you are disadvantaged on all books rolls. While stressed, you cannot take advantage of the key bonus. Tired. While you are tired, you are disadvantaged on all boots and bones rolls. Hurt. While you are hurt, you are disadvantaged on all blades rolls. Down. While you are down, you cannot take any actions until you receive aid from another character or knock on death's door. Wounded. You have taken a dangerous wound. Describe it. The maze controller can call upon your wound to force a disadvantage in situations where your injuries interfere. Most importantly, anytime you go down, you must roll on death's door. Marked. You have knocked upon death's door and are marked. When rolling against death's door, you are disadvantaged. Other potential conditions you may see in the game include blind, charmed, deaf, frightened, held, restrained, or paralyzed, invisible, lost, petrified, turned to stone, poisoned, prone, on fire, or veteran. Remember, kids, 
When you receive aid or healing, roll on this table. You get a one, gasp, knock on death's door. Two, wounded, take wounded, clear down. Three, fill your hearts and stars. Four, stand, clear down, fill your hearts and stars. When you knock on death's door, roll on this table. You knock upon death's door, who answers? Remember, if you're marked, you roll against this at disadvantage. Death's door, one, death takes you. Two and three, shook. Take marked, on your next turn, make a healing roll. Four or more, stand. Take marked, clear down, and fill your hearts and stars. All right, I think that's gonna cover things for today. I really wanted to get through some of the main chunks of mechanics. The next section is really about building up your characters and creating characters. So I'm going to save that for the next video, but thanks for watching, and remember, make mistakes, choose chaos, and most importantly, have fun. We'll see you on the next one. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I did want to add, I've had some comments and feedback of uh, people that seem to think that I'm only interested in roles like games, which is not true, I just happen to be interested in them at the moment. My life is a little bit hectic right now with an 8 month old, and I just haven't had time for really intricate games. But one of the games I really want to look at, which I think is an amazing game, is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So I'll definitely be giving that a read soon, and if you're the more crunchier type, or you think I'm just not giving a balanced view of more intricate games, stay tuned for that. I am very excited about that game. Stay tuned for that video. Thanks for watching.